Um, my name is Mike McNamara. I'm the past chair of DAC. I, I was the chair last year, um, but it's not about me. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Handel Jones. Uh, he's been in the business of uh, studying our industry for more than 30 years. You started when you were like one years old, right? And uh, uh, he's going to give a talk on uh, some of the stuff he's been doing, um, and particularly in the AI area. Um, and like any of these, um, I feel like it's one of the, the evening shows. He's got a book coming out next month, so you can pick it up probably on Amazon, maybe. Um, anyway, but welcome, Dr. Jones. Thank you. So I appreciate being here. The book, by the way, is going to be in Mandarin because it's been published in China by the Chinese press. But anyway, in terms of the um, industry, uh, as was mentioned, we've been tracking the industry now for about 30 years. So we do a lot of work in the advanced technologies. Uh, this includes the uh, seven nanometers right now, five nanometers coming up, and then of course, sub five nanometers. Also looking at the mature technologies in terms of the mixed signal, uh, the RF stuff. And on an overall basis right now, there's a major shortage of design capacity. We don't have enough design engineers. So we have system companies actually getting into the um, semiconductor business because they cannot get custom products or the custom products they want. And there's also a limitation in terms of the number of uh, standard products. So what we see in the industry today, smartphones continue to be the largest consumer of semiconductors. And what we're seeing in smartphones is the migration to what we call superphones. So superphones basically will have very high processing capabilities, maybe 100x of what you have today, maybe even more. And of course, the key driver uh, short term for increased adoption of smartphones or superphones will be augmented reality. And of course, that now requires uh, better fusion processing technologies. So the core of all of these applications is processors and high and high performance processors. And uh, again, you need the algorithms on top of those processors. And that's where we have artificial intelligence coming in. So we think artificial intelligence is going to actually restructure a major part of the electronics industry, a major part of the semiconductor industry, and also the design ecosystem. Because we think that uh, you're going to replace or initially make engineers a lot more productive with the AI tools and supercomputers. And eventually, uh, I think in many cases, you will have a replacement of, um, of um, engineers by supercomputers and the AI tools. Uh, ADAS is an example of where you have uh, artificial intelligence. And, um, and basically, uh, we do see ADAS coming in from a technology point of view fairly rapidly. Uh, that means the processors, uh, we need 100 teraflops. So the leaders today, of course, are NVIDIA and Intel. Uh, but we do see um, a number of other companies developing processors. So ADAS is an example of, of AI. And we think that the automobile companies will install the processors significantly ahead of when level four and level five will be adopted because uh, safety is a very good selling capability. Uh, we also see very high growth in electric vehicles. Uh, again, in terms of our analysis, uh, China will be the, by far the largest market. And when you look at China, what China is doing is not only starting to do the testing, but installing very large battery capacity. Because obviously you see, you know, what Tesla is doing in Nevada, while China is doing that on a much, much bigger scale. And of course, they also have access to the materials, the cobalt, etc. cetera. Uh, data centers is another area where we do see uh, significant enhancements now in terms of capacity, throughput. And the leaders today are in the US. This is Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, etc. And of course, AI becomes a big part of that. What you see in data centers, again, is the need for much higher performance processors. Uh, the x86 architecture today is fairly marginal. The TPU architecture, though, is much more creative and much potentially higher throughput. And of course, memory bandwidth is a key limitation in terms of throughput right now in data centers. Um, but again, even, even, even though we see changes in processor architectures, we do see very high growth in demand for memory, DRAM and NAND. And by our assessment, Samsung is going to be about a $170 billion company in 2027. The revenues of Samsung in DRAM should be about $70 billion. 
uh, in, in NAND, probably about 50 billion. So there's 120 billion. And then for non-memory, this includes the image sensors and some of the other stuff they're doing, potentially 50 billion. So we're talking about 170 billion. So we, we, do see, we do see significant growth opportunities in the industry. The other thing we are seeing, though, is that um, um, China, in our opinion, again, would be the biggest market for the um, data centers. And part of it, of course, is the population issue. US has about 300, 350 million people. China is 1.3 billion. So if you have the same level of, uh, of uh, data capabilities, you need a lot more capacity. Uh, the other point is we are tracking 5G. Uh, China is a clear leader in 5G in terms of the, um, uh, we, in terms of the technology. Uh, tests are being started and also the, um, also the uh, uh, base stations are being installed. And we expect a billion users in China, uh, this is according to China Mobile, in 2027, 2020, sorry, 2025, 2027. So again, the 5G is needed for ADAS. 5G is needed for the uh, augmented reality. And also, we think 5G will drive fairly significant growth in IoT. So this is what we show in terms of the semiconductor market. We track it by product, by capability, et cetera. Uh, we do have relatively strong growth in 2018. A key part of the growth is memory. Uh, basically, DRAM prices are still fairly high. Consumption is about 20 uh, gigabit growth is 20% a year. NAND growth is about 40% a year. And NAND prices are coming down, but not significantly. Uh, we also expect 2019 to be fairly good, fairly positive, but we're getting increasingly concerned with 2020. And if memory prices weaken, then I think you're going to have a fairly significant drop in a short time. Uh, again, the G global GDP is positive, but again, that's going to be another key factor in terms of when the market turns down. So we do track uh, activities by technology node. This shows you TSMC by technology node. Um, the performance, of course, in terms of ramping 16, excellent. The performance in ramping 10, excellent. Uh, we do expect to see excellent performance in ramping uh, 7. The leader, though, in process technology today is Samsung. Uh, Samsung is slightly ahead of TSMC. But again, you have two companies now that are driving uh, the very advanced technology. Intel is a little bit behind, so hopefully Intel will catch up. But, but you can see you can see the trends in terms of the advanced technologies. But you see a big market also in mature technologies. Uh, 180 nanometers may be down a little bit, but not much. Uh, 130 basically may be up a little bit. 180 also up. Some shortages in 200 millimeter capacity. So that's because of power management. That's because of mixed signal. That's because of automotive. But we do see now, though, excess capacity coming in in 28. And uh, part of that has been overcapacity investment in China. And we do see that rippling through. So I think you'll see some overcapacity in terms of the wafer supply in the next couple of years for the mature technologies. And I think that's going to then impact the pricing. Uh, this is what we show in terms of the EDA market. Um, we basically, we've been doing this for a number of years. We conform to the industry standards. You do see growth. We think growth can accelerate. We think there's significant upside potential in terms of uh, additional um, uh, tool capabilities, tool performance. So the upside potential is quite significant. If you, if you look inside this, IP is the biggest category. But this IP, though, is what is provided by the EDA vendors. Uh, and this doesn't include, for example, the ARM revenue does not include some of the Qualcomm revenues. But again, we're talking fairly positive growth. Um, one of the th areas we also cover is design starts. And what you see is design starts on an overall basis being relatively flat. Uh, when we look at the number of designs at 5 nanometers, quite small. And if you look at the cost of a design at 5 nanometers for advanced technology, you're talking potentially $500 million or more. And then you need 10x revenue. So if your design cost is $500 million, you need $5 billion in revenue. And so also, if you're going into a new technology, like 5 nanometers, the IP qualification costs can be $150 million. So if you do multiple designs, of course, you can spread those, the IP qualification costs across those designs. If you do one design, though, you have to add that to design costs. And of course, uh, you have to prepare the design of the IP before you start the design. And of course, uh, 
basically, uh, unless you're in the, in the market at the right time, you can lose that technology. When we look at the number of companies implementing designs at the seven, five nanometers, you're really talking about 10 globally. Uh, and of course, they're, they're Apple, they're Qualcomm, they're iSilicon, you know, you know who they are, NVIDIA and so on. Uh, we do some design activities by the system companies, but again, the issue is design engineers, design engineering capacity, and then the ability to, to also build that, um, build that IP portfolio. But when you look at, at these numbers again, you see a lot of designs in the mature technologies. Uh, you see a lot of designs in, in 130. And of course, they're mixed signal. Uh, they've got some uh, embedded non-volatile. And the skill level on many of those designs is quite high. So again, um, when, when, you, when you look at the overall design environment going forward, uh, basically, right now, we're actually constrained by design capacity. Not enough engineers in the industry. We did an analysis of the um, R&D costs in the industry. We did the analysis of how much of R&D costs goes into design. And then we, load, we looked at the loaded design cost per engineer. And we came up with about 240,000 design engineers on a global basis. If you look at the market going forward, if you look at the growth, we, with, with the present capabilities of the design ecosystem, even with significant improvements, you need another 200,000 engineers. Uh, you can't get them. Uh, even in China, even though it, it, capabilities are being built. Because for the advanced technologies, even for the mixed signal, you need training of five, maybe 10, maybe 15 engineers. The few years. Uh, the other thing we track is also transistor count. So if you look at, again, this is based, you know, we have a lot of games being played in terms of feature dimensions. You know, what is 10 nanometers, what is 7 nanometers, what is 5 nanometers? So we basically take the TSMC numbers, and of course, uh, in our opinion, Intel 10 is equivalent to TSMC 7. But if you look at the number of, of transistors in an 80 square millimeter chip, which is kind of the application processor size, if you look at five, you're talking about 12.5 billion transistors. 12.5 billion. And if you do a smaller chip, you still have maybe five billion transistors. So that's pretty complex based on, if you, if you go back to 2016, you had two billion transistors in an 80 square mil chip. So again, this increase in transistor count based on scaling is an asset. But if you want to do a chip in five nanometers, it actually can be a, a barrier for you because you've got to do maybe a five billion or 10 million billion dollar chip. And of course, the cost of doing that then, of course, could be a 200 million, 300 million, 500 million. Um, what do we see in terms of going to smaller feature dimensions? We actually don't see a significant cost reduction depending on how you do the chip. It actually, the chip can be higher cost. In fact, you know, if Apple spends $20 on a chip versus $16 and they sell a $1,000 phone, it doesn't mean anything. But the big advantage of going to scaling, obviously, is power. The second big advantage is the uh, integration of IP. So if you look at the Snapdragon 845, the number of IP blocks is amazing in that chip right now. The same thing with Huawei, the same thing with, uh, with Samsung. So integration, where you don't have to go on and off the chip, in terms of the migration is, is the biggest benefit we see right now in terms of going to smaller feature dimensions. So we do see five coming in um, in 2020. Uh, again, we'll probably involve six layers of uh, UV and maybe two layers, that's with pellicles, and two layers without pellicles. So then after that, we will have three, we will have two. Again, the timing, there are some issues in terms of how fast um, five will go into high volume production. But we certainly have seven in 2018 and seven plus in 2019. So we spend a lot of time on design costs and we actually generally categorize them into three categories. We have what we call advanced and that's a, that's a complex chip in a new technology. Uh, we have mature, basically where uh, it's, it's, it's the, it's, it's the it's, uh, next generation, the N minus one. And then we have derivatives. So this basically shows you design costs in the advanced technologies. So we show basically the um, IP qualification, uh, the architecture. Verification is by far the highest cost. And of course, verification includes emulation. So we're tracking the capabilities of Cadence, Mentor, and, um, and Synopsys. 
And of course, to us, one of the big things right now is starting to put these capabilities into the cloud. And as you put these capabilities in the cloud, you can basically um, reduce the capex from the buyer point of view, but can also get significantly higher throughput. Um, and as, as the industry migrates to adding these capabilities into the cloud, I think you'll see the, the design costs changing significantly. Uh, we do show the physical uh, implementation costs, this time enclosure, again becoming more difficult and more compromises being made. Ideally, if you, when you go to five, if you can use a five track library, that's great, but you can't. Because, because of crosstalk issues, congestion issues, hotspot issues, et cetera. So you end up using five track, seven track, whatever it is, sorry, seven track, nine track, whatever it is. So you lose some of the advantages of the, uh, of the, of the smaller feature dimensions. But again, uh, we do so software, costs increasing at a fairly rapid rate. And that's another way semiconductor companies and system companies can get value from the new chips increasing the application software content. And of course, as AI comes in uh, more widely adopted, that's a major opportunity. And if you start looking at, if you look at the new application processes, they have neural network cores. And of course, they're now being used to, to, uh, for, for image fusion capabilities. Uh, again, that's gonna support um, uh, augmented reality, but today it gives you better pictures. So you see that in terms of the Qualcomm chips, you see in terms of the high silicon chips or the Cambricon core, and you also see it in terms of the Samsung chips. So again, we do see more of the software content coming in. Security, of course, will also become increasingly important. And of course, the more data you have, the more security you need. So the, the software component, software development will become increasing, increasingly important. So when you, when you look at the industry, you can see in 2017, the non-memory IC market was about $229 billion. Uh, if you look at the IC, uh, the R&D for non-memory, about 36.8. If you look at the CAE value, 5.2 billion. So a huge leverage here. So if you are an, an EDA vendor, why do you get so little money? based on the value you're producing. And of course, part of it has been the competitive pricing structure, uh, but is that gonna change? And uh, we think it will. And we think it will change significantly, but there's also a kind of a threat coming along, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. Um, when we look at design costs today, in most designs, the cost of engineers is about 75% of the design costs. Uh, the CA tools are about 20% and the computer power is about 5%. So as the design teams get bigger, they become less efficient. Uh, so the obvious approach, of course, is to increase computing power. But you can't do that without the tools basically um, being changed to, 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 to address that. So the solution that we're proposing is to establish mega design center concepts. Uh, this is what Morris Chang did with uh, TSMC. And uh, of course, what we have right now is TSMC with a market cap of over 200 billion. And of course, um, a leader, or one of the leaders in terms of the um, process technology development. So within the concept of mega design uh, center where you can actually uh, centralize qualification of IP. If you have 10 companies doing designs, why does everyone have to qualify IP? Uh, why does everybody have to invest in design tools? Uh, you know, we, we're here in China, a couple of hundred, maybe even 500, million, 500 um, fabulous companies. They can't afford design tools. They can't afford to design in 28. So again, for them, this is also uh, an opportunity and an option. So basically, you, you, you establish um, uh, mega centers, high computing power, uh, artificial intelligence to support the EDA tools, and hopefully, initially, improve productivity of design engineers, uh, get more chips into the market, and also, basically, as you get more chips in the market, we think they'll accelerate uh, demand and accelerate the growth of the electronics industry. Uh, so to us, the concept of every company investing the, in terms of the design tools, IP qualification, is becoming obsolete as you go down to five nanometers and less than five nanometers. Because as I said, globally, you have maybe 10 companies in the world that can implement those chips. And that's exactly the same situation that happened in fabs. 
uh, in terms of the advanced fab today, you can only, if you have to invest in five nanometers, you probably have to invest in the fab itself for 50,000 wafers a month, 15 billion, a silly minimum of 10 billion. And then, of course, you have to do the process technology development, which can cost you 3 billion to 5 billion. Um, so that's why in the advanced technologies, at five nanometers, you're going to have potentially three companies globally. In the memory business, it's different. Again, in DRAM, you have three companies, Samsung and um, SK Hynix and Micron, that have 95% of the market. And of course, Samsung in today in DRAM is getting gross profit margin of about 70%. Um, so again, uh, we do think that this concept will basically fit into the factors in terms of the increasing design costs, the increasing requirements for embedding uh, IP. As I mentioned, if you look at the Snapdragon 845 uh, and derivatives, you, right now you have a 4G modem, then you're going to have a 5G modem. You, you have the, um, the ISP, and that, of course, will have to be very powerful for fusion. Um, for fusion of the algorithms, segmentation fusion of the algorithms where they are. You also have the audio stuff. You also have the power management stuff. I mean, you probably have about 100 major blocks. And of course, those blocks become increasingly complex and difficult to qualify. And of course, they have to be qualified in terms of the, of the, um, of the specific process. Now, there will be resistance to, 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 to this concept from the companies that have the IP because they don't want to basically give up that leadership. If you invested um, you know, two or three billion dollars, which is what you have to invest to develop a 5G modem, which is what Qualcomm is doing, which is what High Silicon is doing, which is what uh, Samsung and also India, Intel is doing, you don't want to give up that. But again, I think in terms of the growth of the industry, uh, the same kind of argument also applied in the, in the wafer fab in the past. So in terms of what we see in the industry, as I said, we do see positive growth this year. And if you look at the, what the semiconductor industry has done, what the design ecosystem has done, what the foundry vendors have done, what the, what the equipment vendors have done, I mean, the performance, the capabilities are outstanding. I mean, what, what the industry has contributed to, the semiconductor the electronics industry is outstanding. But of course, we also have now major benefits in terms of smartphones. We have um, basically better data centers, et cetera, et cetera. So then it's got a ripple effect. But again, as I mentioned, we do see increasing probability of a downturn in 2020. The key thing that we look at are number one, global GDP growth. And uh, we do see some potential softening. The trade tariffs, the trade issues to us are very damaging, basically extremely damaging. Uh, because it creates uncertainty. So whichever side of the fence you're on in terms of pro and against, the uncertainty is, is a major problem. And that can actually be a trigger uh, where, where we have a downturn uh, at a faster rate. The other issue is overcapacity. If you look historically as why the industry has turned down, it's turned down because of A, uh, weakening in demand, uh, which is tied into GDP. And the other one, of course, is the overcapacity, uh, which is tied into investment. And we see the potential for both of them converging, but the trade issues can actually result in convergence faster than that. Uh, we do see we do see five nanometers in high sorry seven nanometers high volume this year. Uh, the estimate we have right now is the total capacity of TSMC is getting close to 50,000 wafers a month, and um, we do we do we have a pretty good idea what the yield is. Uh, we're above 70% right now for a 100, for 100 square millimeter chip. So this is on track to yield high volume. The leader probably will be Bitmain, followed by High Silicon, followed by Apple. So that's the order we have right now in terms of companies taking reasonable volume. Uh, but of course, by Q3 of this year, Apple will be probably 40,000 wafers a month. And then we do see the ramp up of five nanometers in 2020. We think there's a possibility that will slip. And the reason it could slip is because EUV isn't quite ready. Pellicles aren't quite ready. And to go to a phase where you go from zero to 50, 60, 70,000 wafers a month, uh, right now it's a challenge. If we don't go to five nanometers, we can extend seven nanometers, seven plus, 
Uh, we do see Samsung having multiple generations of technologies more than TSMC. But the issue with that, of course, is IP qualification. Will companies qualify IP at eight? When seven is coming, will they qualify? So because, because you do need a set of 150 million at least to qualify IP. So we do see continued benefits of migration to three and two. But again, you have to look at what the benefits are, and in case integration is one of them. But again, if you can't meet the time to market of the uh, smartphone, which is one year design issues, uh, there could be postponement. Uh, so we don't see the one or two year schedule being maintained. Uh, we think it could be three or four years, maybe even five years. And of course, we, we are tracking get all around technology. We're tracking these different technologies. Uh, again, each one becomes significantly more complex. Even if you scale the transistor, you still have to scale the middle end of line. Uh, cobalt is being used, but there's no follow on to cobalt that we can see. And of course, the big issue is scaling a back end of line where interconnect parasitics determine performance in most cases now. So unless you get a new dielectric material, unless you get even uh, uh, or significantly something better than copper, TSMC is doing large grain copper, but that's not a big improvement. If you don't scale the back end of line, you don't get significant improvement in performance, and you might also not get significant improvement in density. So we are, we are basically getting into, into some major challenges here. Uh, and of course, if you don't have the high volume demand, you can't justify the fab investment. And whether the data centers by themselves will be big enough to support the migration to smaller feature dimensions in this time frame, again, that's going to be an issue. So we do think it's going to continue to happen, but again, the, the uh, costs or the cost and time will increase. And then as I mentioned, as you do go to smaller feature dimension, transistor count goes up, and to get the value of, of that of transistor count, you have to do 10 billion, 15 billion, 20 billion transistor chips. And those cost you 500 million, 600 million, maybe a billion dollars, you have a lot of software. And again, you need 10x revenue, so now you need 5 billion 10, uh, or potentially 10 billion in revenue. And of course, not many applications give you that kind of uh, revenue leverage. Um, as I mentioned, we do have a significant shortage of design capacity. To train an engineer in five nanometers probably will take five years, 10 years, maybe 15 years. So you can't just uh, basically add engineers without providing the training. So again, you need, we need different solutions, and the industry should be very innovative in these solutions. And again, in our, we have one suggestion, and I'm sure in the audience here we have very smart people. You have other suggestions also. So our suggestion, as I said, is the mega design concept. And again, I think um, we are not seeing any significant momentum in that area to date, but we are starting to see activities in terms of putting the tools on the cloud. Uh, and I think that's going to have a significant improvement in improving design productivity in the near term. So that's my presentation. I appreciate being here, and thank you very much.